as a group, which is a, a study group for vernacular architecture in Yorkshire, I'm sure you could have spent quite a lot of time and have spent quite a lot of time defining exactly what we do mean, in fact, by vernacular and vernacular architecture. No, I don't want to go into that now. But I'm sure one thing we could all agree on um, is that one of the things that defines it uh, is the use of local materials where that's possible. Um, all the sorts of materials that go into a building um, really have to be processed in some sort of way, uh, whether you're talking about converting wood to building timber or uh, quarrying stone, and then it has to, of course, be uh, dressed and so on by masons, um, uh, and, and other building, uh, building materials too. Um, the two I want to talk about tonight are the production of brick and also the production of lime. Um, both are required, of course, in making brick and other buildings as well. Uh, and were once extremely common and very widespread rural industries. But, and I want to make this very clear and obvious, um, I want to concentrate this evening on that rural industry uh, and not what they were to become uh, later in the 19th century. In other words, um, I am not want to talk about places like this. This is the massive Harper Hill Lime Works near Buxton, um, producing uh, uh, lime on a truly industrial scale, um, nor do I want to talk about brickworks like this. This is the Whitaker Brothers' uh, brickworks in Leeds. Um, you can see this massive uh, kiln where the bricks were made, an equally massive chimney to ventilate it. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the, the emanations, really, the, uh, of, of, of more local industries supplying purely local needs, not great urban industries here supplying uh, much larger interests and having much larger outputs uh, and slightly different techniques of production as well. And um, so what I want to do tonight is, first of all, um, this is a bit ambitious, actually. Outline stages in lime and brick production, and, and forgive me if it's a very, very general outline. I'd like to illustrate this with some examples from the East Riding of Yorkshire. I pick on the East Riding because it's a, a, a part of Yorkshire, I think, which for some uh, things has been little researched. Um, and these were very common industries in the East Riding once. And I want to end with a case study of Hunmanby, which is near Filey, if you don't know where that is, um, and ask the question, because we've got uh, examples both of lime production and, and, and brick making in that village, um, can we identify some of those local buildings which were built with those local products? So let's start with lime. Lime had many uses. Um, one of the biggest uses, of course, was for agricultural purposes. Um, uh, but it was also a, a, a really important constituent in the building industry. It supplied the basis of making mortars, of plasters, um, of washes, for instance, that could be simply uh, lime let down to a suitable consistency with water or pigments could be added. It was made by basically breaking up limestone or chalk uh, and then burning, really heating it to a high temperature in a kiln. Um, it was a process known as calcination. Um, and I, I give you my schoolboy chemistry here about what's happening. Um, limestone or chalk, of course, is basically calcium carbonate. Once you heat it, uh, to high temperatures for a long time. It drives off carbon dioxide and it drives off any residual moisture too, to leave you with calcium oxide, quicklime, a dry, very unstable material. If you add water to that, uh, if you add, I'm sure some people have done this in the past. Um, it's, if you're not very, very careful with it, it produces huge amounts of heat, chucks the water back out at you, uh, and you've got to be very careful. It's a very unstable substance, really. I always remember my grandmother, who once a year used to lime wash her cellars in her house by buying quick lime from the local hardware store and letting me let it down with water. They probably bring social services in nowadays to find anybody doing that. Um, but uh, it was a common practice, I think, in the past. So um, how did we, um, how, how was this made? Uh, Basically, there were two or three or four different types of kiln, but two common ones was, and I get this courtesy of University College London, was the flare kiln, where 
you very often into a, a bank or hillside built um, uh, a lined uh, chamber. At the bottom of this, you might build a sort of vault of limestone or stone. Um, you had a stoke hole here where you could put fuel. You loaded it with the crushed or pounded uh, limestone or chalk stone, and you burnt that for a long time. Uh, it then fell in, you could rake it out, it came out with the ash. It wasn't exactly a pure process. Um, there was also the draw kiln. Uh, the draw kiln was somewhat different. As you can see here, um, it, um, uh, it has uh, a grate here at the stoke hole or draw hole end with a layer of fuel, a layer of uh, limestone or chalk stone, another layer of fuel, layer of limestone and so on. It's a bit like a lasagna, isn't it, when you sort of start uh, 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 layering it up. The, this burns again for a long time, drops through the grating, can be drawn out. But as it does so, of course, leaves a gap at the top. So you could then add more fuel, more limestone or whatever. And in theory, at any rate, uh, practice might be different. But in theory, yeah, it, was, it could be a continuous process. You could keep uh, burning it as long as you wanted. I think in practice, when you get some of the documentation about this, um, we see that in fact, they weren't used continuously, draw kilns like this. This way of producing lime was very common right across Britain and Europe for that matter in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, in Yorkshire, we can find standing remains of these sorts of kilns very commonly in the dales, this picture comes courtesy of the Yorkshire Dales National Park of either a, a flare or draw kiln. Uh, this one built, as you can see, in stone. You can quite clearly see the stoke or draw hole here lost its top a bit. Um, if you look, for example, in the East Riding, I think it's more common to find kilns like those illustrated by the artist W.H. Pine um, in, uh, I checked my notes to get it right here, 1802, in his publication, um, The Costume of Great Britain. Here, he illustrates um, uh, lime burners. And you can see how built into this bank side, we have more of a sort of um, basin-shaped or beehive-shaped kiln, uh, stoke hole or draw hole here. In this case, if it's accurate, steps leading round to it people bringing product in uh, uh, barrels to be burnt here and noxious fumes uh, coming off the uh, coming off the, the kiln itself. Um, in the East Riding very few remain intact. Um, they're more like this. Here um, is the remains of a kiln which I, I admit is, is not in the East Riding. It's in Welburn near Moulton. Uh, which is almost there. Um, but you can see this photograph, which is from the 1970s, incidentally, which a friend of mine took. Um, you can see here the remains of the bowl of the kiln. Uh, you can see the, the, the huge amount of insulation at the sides here uh, with rubbly sort of brick. Looks as though it might have been a draw kiln when you look at the, um, what seems to be the layers of burning here, still uh, extant across it uh, in various uh, places. Um, it's not there anymore, it's gone. Um, but we can find uh, evidence, uh, good evidence in fact, um, of, of these sorts of lime kilns, even though I don't think uh, there are any typical standing remains in the eastern part of the county. Here, for example, we move over towards uh, Flamborough. I think most people know where Flamborough is on the coast. Um, and uh, here we've got the remains of a lime kiln just here in this sort of enclosure. The uh, front of it here has been broken. Uh, the figure here gives you some idea of the scale. If we move in a bit closer up here, you can see that we've got part of the uh, rear, I think, of the kiln uh, remaining, the brick lining. Let's go in a bit closer. It becomes very obvious uh, that that's the case uh, and steps back. Uh, for, you know, it, it's not just one brick thick. Um, and if we look back down here in this direction too, we can see what looks to be like um, a sort of layers of uh, layers of brick given as a sort of depressed arch, which may well have been uh, the entrance to the stoke hole or draw hole. Um, 
remains like this uh, uh, in the East Riding, remains of kilns in the East Riding, uh, perhaps unlike some parts of the North Riding, are very much a sort of uh, archaeological uh, remains, uh, and many of them below ground or, or, or semi-ruinous like this. You could write books about lime kilns, I'll come later to one that has been recently. Um, uh, that's a very quick run through, and I want to give you another very quick run through about brick making. Um, but lime building, the, uh, lime burning, uh, as, as we've just seen, for instance, was once very common throughout Yorkshire, uh, as well as other parts. It was an ancient sort of uh, craft, if you want to call it that. We know about it from Roman times, and it's just the same in some ways as the next subject, and that's brick. Uh, brick had similarly been uh, produced in Britain and across Europe for, for centuries, centuries. Uh, but here I want to concentrate on the 18th into the 19th century. Um, and again, if you look throughout the, and a good source of um, uh, 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 sort of survey material, of course, are the first and, and slightly later editions of the Ordnance Survey maps, starting what, about late 1840s into the 1850s, we can see that there were many small local brickworks throughout Yorkshire. Um, so how did you make brick? Right, here uh, I have a picture of the brick makers, 1821, a coloured lithograph, which I uh, have uh, courtesy of the Welcome Collection, Welcome Institute. And it gives you the whole processes here, process here in one. Sort of over in the background, you've got the clay field that bricks were being made from, dug, very often dug perhaps in the, um, in the, in the uh, autumn to winter and then uh, left to lie there and to sort of weather. Um, brick making was pretty seasonal. Um, that clay could then be placed into this contraption here, a pug mill. Um, a pug mill at the bottom of that sort of pit that you see the horse wandering round, being driven round, were two things that looked like massive millstones, but turned on their edges rather than being flat. What they did was go round and round and round, grind the clay uh, and make it more pliable in that sense. It could then be unloaded and brought, and often women were um, uh, employed as, as part of the uh, uh, workforce in, in brickyards. Um, it was then brought uh, to the brickmaking table here, where you see the brickmaker taking a great lump of it and throwing it into this mould here to produce a brick. Bricks were then taken on a specially adapted barrow here, and in this case, brought round to this thing here, um, which is a brick clamp. This was one of the ways in which bricks might be uh, burnt, might be, might be heated up uh, and formed into bricks. Um, they were built into massive, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, rectangles with, with battered sloping sides. Um, towards the bottoms and throughout, uh, you could place then um, uh, uh, fuel, uh, very often um, um, brushwood and ashes and things like this, so coal, coal uh, which could be lit and was kept burning for a long time. With a brick clamp like that, you could perhaps make up to, according to contemporary sources, uh, around about 20,000 bricks. Um, it took maybe a week or two to build one. It took another week or two for, for them to burn for them to the right temperature. And you didn't have a great deal of control over the temperature in a clamp uh, owing to weather. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> you have to let them cool down before you can handle them. So it, it takes them perhaps a month, six weeks, something like that, to burn a great big clamp of bricks like that. Um, that was one way of making it, the brick clamp. There are many myths that you read, I think, in local histories, where it says, and in such and such a village, we had a brick making yard, and what they did there was to make bricks and lay them out, and they would lie there for about a year or two years to harden. But that didn't really happen. Um, it didn't happen because if you left wet bricks out in winter, they would shatter with frost. Um, but they were burnt in clamps like that. Or, of course, you could have kilns. And kilns were known from quite early dates. Now, uh, I mislead you here because these kilns uh, are not typical. They're not round here. Um, but I, I show it. These are kilns from Great Linford, which is near um, at Milton Keynes. Um, and, and they date from the second half, probably the late 19th century. But it gives you some idea, I think, of, of, of the small scale of some kilns at brickworks, in country brickworks. Uh, and Great Linford is, is very much a village. Uh, these stand not far from the church in Great Linford, for instance. 
Um, you could make the same, the same sort of quantities of bricks in small kilns like this as you could in other things. Um, but if you go to one of the uh, contemporary sources in the 19th century, which shows you what a lot of kilns look like, early kilns, um, this is taken from a, a book with a marvellous title, um, A Rudimentary Treatise on the Manufacture of Bricks and Tiles by Edward Dobson, published in 1850. Um, he gives um, uh, an illustration there of uh, a kiln which is probably, probably, I, I don't know, one guesses in terms of the East Riding, uh, may have been typical uh, in this area. Um, yes, the kiln is here, the kiln itself either built of brick or stone, but notice the lean-to sheds at either side, which had um, uh, uses in being able to store and thus keep dry um, fuel, uh, but also bricks. Bricks couldn't be just made and shoved into the kiln. Uh, they had to have a period of drying. Um, This was once common across the East Riding, brickmaking, I mean. Um, but now I think, and if anyone wants to correct me on this, um, I'm not going to get huffy about it. In fact, I should be delighted. But I don't think there are any standing remains uh, of rural brick kilns in the East Riding. Um, not typical ones. There are one or two which are rather odd. Um, but it was once the most important rural industry. Um, let me illustrate this by showing you, if I've got these in the right sequence, ah, yes, a map of Killam. Killam is a village on the Wolds. Um, Killam uh, stands ooh, roughly between Driffield and Bridlington uh, and up towards Filey. He stands in that sort of area there, uh, but, but on the top of the Wolds. So here, let me point this out first, is Killam village itself. And then if we go on the road out and off here, we get to brick and tile works. Um, and it's important to mention at this point, perhaps, that um, not only were bricks made, especially in this part of the, the world where a lot of um, roofs are made of, uh, are covered with pan tile, um, but um, tiles could be made as well where you had kilns. I don't think you could clamp tiles. Um, they're usually uh, kilned. And, and the other thing that was often commonly made in brickworks too were agricultural drains. You know, those great big earthenware pipes um, which could be used to uh, drain fields. So if you had kilns, you had the possibility of making not just bricks, but tiles and agricultural drains. But you can see from this, let me point it out, depends how big your screen is, of course, doesn't it? Um, here you had a uh, old clay pits. Here there is more clay pits. Here uh, a brick field um, and here a number of buildings which it doesn't say what they are but I take it to mean that they were kilns and probably drying sheds and places where bricks were made. It's quite extensive as you can see uh, and we know quite a bit about this one as well because it belonged to a family of farmers called Dickinson from Killam. They had a farm, but they also owned this brickworks. And when one of their members, the head of their family, died in 1833 uh, in April, the Yorkshire Gazette carried this advertisement for the sale of the farm together with what it says here. And I'll read this out as I say, it depends what size your, your screen is. Also, that well known brick and tile yard at Killam with the cottages and gardens, kilns machinery for grinding clay, sheds and other works, erected at an immense expense by the late Mr. John Dickinson for the manufacture of all kinds of bricks, tiles and coarse pots. A very extensive trade has been carried on here for the last 14 years with great success. The clay is of the first rate quality. And so it goes on. This was sold to a family called Lamplu. Uh, who similarly lived in Killam, actually. Um, they're certainly working it till the 1880s. By the 1890s, there's no mention of it. If you go looking for that site today, there it is, Google Earth. Um, and that is the Brickworks site. Old clay pits here, that area of kilns, more clay pits, but it's all gone. It's been taken back into agricultural use. And I think you find that uh, is typical of many, many 
um, brickworks uh, sites in, in, in the East Riding. Um, what sort of conclusions could we come to? Um, this is a very quick uh, uh, run through of, of, of how you produce bricks, how you produce clay. Um, to begin with, there are certain common features in both of these industries. Um, there were small scale operations. They were rural, but near villages and supplied really uh, the um, uh, uh, needs of, of, of villages or nearby small towns. They supplied local needs, distances. Well, to deliver bricks over distances was expensive. It's a heavy material. Even when the railways first make their appearance, it's still quite uh, expensive to move bricks, although that changes. They were also seasonal as well. Um, making bricks is a activity mostly carried on, I think, uh, in the summer months. According to that book by Dobson, which I mentioned before, he says that the brick making season began in April and went on till September. Um, winter doesn't play well with brick clamps and trying to burn bricks with rain coming down with frosts and so on. So because they were seasonal, seasonal rather, um, they couldn't um, be uh, pursued the whole year round for an income. Hence, uh, they were very much a secondary occupation or trade, typically in the hands of farmers, uh, other well-to-do uh, people in, in various villages and small country towns. Um, even after the advent of the railways, a lot of the supply of bricks remained pretty local. Um, and um, it was easier and cheaper to get them from local suppliers until really big brick making concerns came in. Um, what I want to do next then is to um, move and have a look at the last part of this talk, and that is to look at Home Mumby. Uh, Home Mumby is, is, is stands, uh, well, it's what about two miles inland from uh, the coast, it's about um, three miles from Filey. Um, it is a large village, always has been. And here's a plan of Humbunby from uh, Jeffrey's maps, uh, the County of York surveyed, uh, surveyed in fact in the late 18th, uh, sorry, no, surveyed in the late 1760s, published in the uh, early 1770s. Um, and pretty accurate maps from what I can gather as well. So here is Humbunby. To the north, notice this street here. It suddenly ends. And at the end of this street, although Jeffreys doesn't mark it on, was a brickfield, um, a brickworks. And that had been there since at least the 1720s, because in the Manor Court Rolls, which in part um, uh, still exist for this uh, village in the uh, East Riding Record Office, complaint is made of people digging for clay illegally. There's also mentioned uh, that this was near a close called Brick Kiln Close. So we know brick making from documentary evidence has gone on there for a long time. Lime was also produced in several places. Some of the lime produced were what we might call field kilns. That is, it was small kilns temporarily used making lime for um, agricultural production. However, down here, in this area here to the south, um, there was a much larger, what we might call a lime works. There'd always been um, the parish's uh, lime pit there for taking, <coughs> excuse me, chalkstone to mend roads and so on, and to make some lime perhaps for mortars. Um, but during the course of the 19th century, this was sold to a local farming family who developed it far uh, more extensively. Let me show you what I mean. This is the bottom end of that road we were just looking at here. And there are three uh, chalk pits. Pit is, is, is a rather sort of understatement. These were quarries really. Um, you've got one here uh, on this uh, west side of the road, together with what the Ordnance Survey marks on as kilns. And I should say this is the uh, Ordnance Survey surveyed in the late 1880s. 25 inches to the mile. Across to the east, you've got an old chalk pit. That one was developed over a massive area here. And then just to the south of it, uh, a further chalk pit. Um, this was taken over by a farming family of Hunmanby called Lawty, L-A-W-T-Y. Um, 
And uh, they'd been a traditional farm, uh, uh, farming family, but had given up their traditional house in the centre of Humbenby and eventually had built this house here, uh, which became known as Limeworks House. Uh, not a vernacular house, actually, a house built probably 1880s or just before. Um, I'm going to take a view now from this chalk pit back towards here um, to give you some idea of the extensive uh, development that this uh, line works uh, was making. And yet it was selling to a largely, as far as I can gather, uh, local market. It was selling to farmers and builders round about. And although there was um, a, a railway station just nearby, um, it wasn't really until the Lortys went bust uh, through their mismanagement of this uh, whole place, really, in the 1890s, um, that the railway was used in exporting uh, lime from the home of the lime works to other parts. So for much of the 19th century, this was purely local. If you go to this area here, um, where there was a further um, chalk pit or chalk quarry, where the kilns were, that's what you see nowadays. Um, and this is what you see in many parts of the East Riding, I think, where there were former kilns and pits. I'm sure if you were to be able to go down there and start sort of clearing it of trees, you'd find the remains of those kilns. Nothing much seems to be touched here, but it's very typical uh, in this farming area that farmings and farmers, and quite laudably uh, in many cases, um, have planted these with scrub and trees. It forms a wildlife reserve, of course. Uh, but we vernacular architecture historians and archaeologists, though, we don't like it, do we? Um, because we can't see what we want to see. Nevertheless, um, this is typical of what you might find if you go out looking for them. Well, moving from lime to brick um, and looking at that road to the north of the uh, village, here's what uh, Jeffreys um, shows, that sort of cranking road here, which is known as Northgate. But you see from this first edition ordnance survey surveyed in 1849, that here you've got one brick field, and here you've got another slightly larger brick field as well. This one is worked out first, but it has a building on it, which I would guess is a kiln. I suspect further kilns here. Um, but, um, this whole complex here had been around probably since the beginning of the 18th century and certainly the beginning of the 19th. In 1820 or just before, it was bought by a farming family you know, uh, called the Hutchinsons and they ran it together with their farm. I want you to notice that little blob there where the cursor is. That is quite important. I'm going to cut next to a view of it from Google Earth. Um, nowadays, and you can see that that clay field is pretty much intact apart from some building here. Although having looked around it, um, uh, there's, um, there's nothing much in the way of sort of archaeological remains there. And the bigger area of field is here. This is the older area of Brickfield. This brick field, the Hutchinsons has worked this out by about 1890 or slightly before. By 1900, all of this site here had been turned over to allotment gardens and by the 1970s it was being built on. Um, again, I've, I've, I've looked at the gardens here at one or two and again, um, there is nothing left. But there's that little pair of buildings that we saw before. They're still there and there they are today. Now remove all that pebble dash and all that UPVC uh, and what you've probably got under there is a pair of brick built mirror image cottages. This brings us to the question of you know um, can we be can we identify any buildings that were um, uh, locally produced uh, or rather, rather produced from local brick. Um, these probably were um, and we know that it was the Hutchinsons that built them because the Hutchinsons by the site around about 1820. They raise a mortgage on the site in 1852 and the deed specifically says, and uh, let me quote from this, um, that it was a brick field now containing two cottages thereon. So they built them sometime between about 1820 and 1850. And indeed, if you go into the 1851 census, you see that on one side, 
uh, one, one cottage, there is a brick maker living in the other cottage, there's a tile maker living. So, you know, pretty good evidence uh, that this was so. So, can you identify buildings uh, that were built of local brick? It's a definite maybe. Uh, here's one of the definites. I know for certain, well, all right, I know pretty certainly that this house was produced from local home and brick. Why? Because it was the house of Francis Hutchinson who owned the brickworks. I can't see him sending out somewhere else uh, to have bricks to rebuild his own house, rebuilt around about uh, 1840, 1850. Um, much of it lime washed over now, but um, you can see from the gable and then uh, this is the shadow of an earlier building, the earlier cottage that's been removed from the gable. Um, you can see that there you've got these very typically thin, long uh, local bricks, some of them badly burnt, uh, some of them um, pretty fair bricks and, and doing, the, doing the job still actually. Notice the tumbling too at the gable here, uh, where bricks are put uh, at an angle in to provide a, a better platform for the, um, <clears throat> for the, the uh, coping to the verges of the roof. Then again, um, here, um, perhaps sometimes when we think of vernacular buildings, we tend to think mostly of houses, in barns and agricultural buildings, but there's lots more interesting buildings. This is the lockup uh, in Hunmanby, which was built in about 1832 by the parish. And of course, guess who was one of the parish officers? Yes, it was Hutchinson family, owners of the brickworks. Um, one can't see the parish officers sending out of the um, uh, a village to somewhere like Scarborough to get the bricks brought in, which would have cost them a lot extra in, in, in carting the brick there. Um, but you can see that it's mostly brick uh, where the doors pad, uh, lock into the brickwork, stone has been used and stone for a plaque up here. <coughs> Excuse me. That stone is probably a local um, uh, stone. I'm not quite sure where that might have come from, um, uh, but it's probably, a, well it's not probably, it certainly is a calcareous limestone or, or, or sorry, a calcareous uh, sandstone or gritstone. The roof uh, looks like a 20th century one um, and no gutter too has led to serious deterioration as you can see here uh, above the, um, uh, the coupling of the doors. Um, I strongly suspect it was thatch when you go inside this building, quite interesting as a lockup, um, the ceilings to the building, it's not left open to the roof as you might expect in a humble building like that. Um, there are huge um, uh, uh, stone slabs that span from one end of the uh, building to the other end of the building. In other words, you couldn't get out of this cell, you couldn't get through and get through the roof. Um, it sealed you in. Um, so, here, probably another uh, product of the local brickworks. And more than that, probably a product of the local lime works as well, because mortar has obviously been used to hold this together. And in recent repairs, it was quite obvious that it was a lime mortar as well, of course, which is exactly what you'd expect. Um, here's a maybe. Um, this is about two miles down the road from uh, Humminby. This is um, at uh, St uh, Staxton, no, Flixton. Um, and this is the primitive uh, Methodist chapel there, uh, built in 1821. Um, again, I'd take a, a, a guess uh, that this, that the brick here probably did come from uh, Humminby's brickworks as well. It's the same quality of brick, same size, but that's not saying much because much, there's much of a muchness there, uh, wherever you get the brick from at this sort of date. Um, but consider if you drew a 10 mile radius around this little building, um, Humminby would be the nearest brickworks by far. Uh, Filey, where well, there was another, another brickworks five miles away, Humminby about two miles away, Scarborough brickworks, nearest brickworks about eight miles away. Um, so it's a reasonable supposition, though it may not be correct, uh, that this is again very local brick, very humble building, roof altered once again, and once again in the lintels here to doors and windows and uh, a calcareous sandstone or gridstone. Um, I'm coming to the end now. Um, 
But it's important to say, of course, what I've been concentrating on here tonight is two materials. Um, but often local buildings are far more complicated than that, of course, um, and use combinations of buildings. Obviously, most buildings use timber as well as what we've been talking about. Uh, but in the East Riding, uh, you can also find stone in corporate quantities, mostly uh, chalk stone. Uh, in my opinion, a lousy building material uh, because it soaks up the damp and bits of it shear off every uh, every winter. Uh, but there's also areas of sandstones and gritstones and limestones too. Um, so let me show you by way of concluding it what I mean about the sort of multiple use of uh, local materials. This is in the village of Muston, which again is about um, two to three miles from Humberby. And what an array of building materials, modern roof, so we'll discount that for the time being, but the main wall of chalk stone, as you can see, um, originally a, a long three celled house with, I think, the original door somewhere up here. Um, you can see, though, that the gables are of brick, uh, that the roof has been raised here, probably in the later 19th century to give better headroom, but that also it stands on a base here as you can see, of what is um, uh, a sand or gritstone, a calcareous sandstone or gritstone. So there's a real combination of uh, materials. Um, but you can place some of these, I think. It must be um, uh, this, th this chalk stone came from a mile and a half, well, sorry, it came from about three quarters of a mile up the road at Muston Chalkstone Quarry. Um, it would have been madness for people building a house like this to go miles and miles out of their way to bring it in and pay extra. Um, and also the Muston Chalkstone Quarry, which is not far away from this house at all, um, had lime kilns and so probably the mortars for it came from there too. And again, I'd guess that the brick is local. It could have been Humminby brick. It might have been Filey brick. That is, is, is not much farther on, you know. Um, so the, you, you're getting these sorts of combinations of, uh, of, of materials as well, as well as things just be all of brick or, you know, uh, uh, all of one material. Uh, combinations are quite interesting, but it's interesting to try and track down the sources of some of this, I think, as well. Um, well, what Humbenby, the Humbenby case study, I think, uh, uh, displays well uh, are the characteristics of these industries, small scale, time-honoured methods um, and combined usually uh, with another occupation in their supply. Um, supplying largely local needs. They didn't have the capacity for great buildings in expanding towns nor massive housing speculations. Uh, they could supply the lesser needs of stable or even slightly declining uh, villages or, or, or small country towns. Um, but by the later years of the 19th century, the traditional clay fields have often been worked out. Um, brickworks closed, but more importantly than that, I think, um, local population pressures, the much larger sorts of um, uh, 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 combines that were coming into operation then with the mechanization of many processes, probably from the 1850s or so, um, and also falling transport costs was a further factor in the demise of these sorts of industries. Indeed, by 1890, most rural bricklaying in this area and lime burning um, had closed. It had finished, really. Uh, and it was to be superseded by large firms, often in more or less the same areas. Um, if you go only 10 miles up the road from here to Seema near Scarborough, you find uh, that by 1890 or so, you've got the Crossgates Quarry on Seema Limeworks, a massive undertaking. Here a huge Hoffman kiln uh, for presumably converting limestone to, um, sorry, yeah, converting limestone rather to lime uh, with, with what the ordnance map marks on as a big chimney here. Uh, notice too um, how you've got further buildings related to it, how you've also got a tramway uh, which leads to the chalk face here. Um, and then just what? 
about a mile up the road from that, you have the Seema Road brick and tile works, a really massive undertaking with here what looks like a big Hoffman kiln with a chimney and then here uh, a further two kilns presumably because they've got two chimneys here and again um, tramways going into the clay face and notice also how they're aligned uh, with railway sidings up here as indeed the Seema line works was as well. Finally if you want to study this um, what do you look at? Well, there's not a lot actually. There are many, many individual local history and local archaeology papers um, uh, relating to local sites, local digs, local histories, um, but little of this being put in a national context. Most books on building too make some mention of it, um, either lime or brick making, um, uh, but you may only get a paragraph or two or a couple of pages. Far better now is, is some of the publications coming on the market. I would recommend David Johnson's Lime Kilns, A History and Heritage, uh, published in 2018. Um, really, uh, I, I, I don't think it's going too far to say a groundbreaking work in the sense, and no pun intended there, by the way, uh, in the sense that um, uh, you've not got really a, a books which are devoted wholly to that and devoted to it not just in, a, in a, a parochial sense, it spans the country, it deals with Europe to some extent as well. Johnson's all got, got a, a book forthcoming on brick making. Um, when I say forthcoming, I think it's this summer sometime if it hasn't come out already. If you want a contemporary uh, comment on this, there's uh, Edward Dobson, a rudimentary treatise on the manufacture of bricks and tiles, 1850. Um, I've used that quite a lot actually for one or two things. It, it's an excellent book. And if you think, you will never get hold of that, um, you can actually find it online. Um, or you can even buy it. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of print to order book that you can get even on Amazon for quite a reasonable price. Um, that's about as far as I want to take it tonight. Uh, but of course, if there are any questions, I'll be delighted to uh, try and answer them, but I don't promise they'll be very good answers. <laughs>